Okay, welcome to lecture 1.3. Uh, we are talking about William Wundt and uh, his objective sensation and subjective feelings. Let's look at this picture of uh, Campbell's tomato soup. Objectively, we all see the same thing. We see a can of tomato soup, a painting of a can of tomato soup. Subjectively uh, is how we interpret that information. Now, I see it and I see a can of soup. Other people see it and that painting is worth millions of dollars because it was done by Andy Warhol. Now, I don't know much about art. Some people do and they go, oh my gosh, that's beautiful. But to me, it's a can of soup. So that's where we vary or where we differ. Um, so objectively, it's the same thing. Subjectively is what we see. When we see different people, the same thing. If I bring Angelina Jolie into class, everybody sees the same thing objectively. But subjectively is how we interpret it. Some people see it and go, oh, she's brave. She's done this double mastectomy. She's saved all these women in Africa and all, and she's adopted all these poor kids. Other people go, oh, she's a wife, you know, she's a husband stealer. So everybody's got their opinions on it. All right. Um, the mind functions by combining these two basic elements, and that's what Want wanted to say. All right. The next guy, William James, and there's a picture of Willie. Um, he founded the school of functionalism. So we have structuralism and functionalism. He disagreed with one, that he thought that experience is a stream of consciousness. In other words, there's not little bits and pieces, it's just this constant flow of elements. Um, he wrote The Principles of Psychology in 1890. It's considered the first textbook on psychology. Remember, the first book was Piri Sykes, written by Aristotle, but the first textbook is the principles of psychology. Functionalists uh, are concerned with how mental processes give organi help organisms adapt to their environment. In other words, uh, you know, if a, a squirrel is out in the woods and he hears something roar and the next thing he knows his friends have been eaten, then he has, must adapt to it. Uh, you know, we hear the same thing. If we hear a certain sound and the next thing something bad happens, we adapt to our environment as quickly as possible. Uh, successful behaviors are repeated, unsuccessful ones are dropped. So if we do something that works, we do it again. If we do something that doesn't work, we quit using it. Uh, that's learning. That's the definition of learning. Okay, the difference between functionalism and structuralism. Uh, structuralism asks the question, what are the elements or the structures of the psychological process? Functionalism asks, what are the purpose of these behaviors or mental processes? In other words, one asks, what are the parts? The other one asks, what do the parts do? Now, if you're like me, you're listening to this going, what in the world is he talking about? It's all theoretical. We can't prove this guy's right and this guy's right. Nobody can prove which one's right. It's complete theory. So. As long as you're familiar with what they are, I mean, if you talk to somebody who's a psych major in college, they may go, well, what are you? And you would say, oh, I'm a functionalist or I'm a structuralist. Does it make any difference? Not really. So, um, next guy, Sigmund Freud, um, probably one of the most famous psychologists of all time. There's a uh, picture of Sigismund Shlomo Freud. Um, he was considered the father of psychoanalysis very important. Uh, he's the guy who most people follow today. He emphasized the importance of unconscious motives and internal conflicts in determining human behavior. In other words, we really don't know why we do what we do. It's an unconscious thing that drives us. Um, he was big into the interpretation of slips or dreams. If you meet somebody and uh, you say goodbye rather than hello, then perhaps you don't really want to meet them. Uh, or if you're talking to somebody and you call them you know, you're talking to this girl you're dating and you accidentally call her your ex-girlfriend's name. Perhaps you want to be subconsciously, you want to be with your ex rather than her. So, uh, and then dreams, um, Freud was considered somewhat of a perv. Uh, he was considered the love doctor, called the love doctor in his day. Um, talked a lot about sex. Um, he had a, a complex called the Oedipus Complex, which meant that boys were secretly in love with their mothers and wanted to kill their father. Uh, it was based on a play from um, Sophocles called Oedipus Rex. Uh, but, you know, it was a lot to do with sex. We have this unconscious motives. I mean, we're animals, and so 
therefore it goes back to our basis where we want to have sex with a lot of things. Um, he did his research through consultations with patients, not in a lab. He would lay people on a couch. Uh, originally he did that because he hypnotized people and it was easier to hypnotize people when they were laying down. Um, but he could talk to them and he found that as he talked to them, they got better. Um, and their uh, neurosis would go away, whatever their problem happened to be. Uh, he felt that you're driven by your subconscious mind. I mean, you're, you know, you are not really in control of what you're doing. Subconsciously, something else is making you do that. His theories are so, sometimes called psychodynamic thinking, and that's really just come around in the past 10 years. Um, next guy, John B. Watson. Uh, we're moving more into the modern era now. He was the founder of behaviorism. Felt that it was unscientific to study conscious because it is impossible to tell what other people are thinking, especially animals. My little dog follows me all over the place. I have no idea what he's thinking. He's probably thinking, I hope he drops some food. Uh, but we really don't know. Um, and he was going back and saying, look, you guys are th all theoretical. You're, everybody's laughing at us uh, because we can't prove anything. So he thought it was very unscientific to be that way. So he said we need to make it much more scientific. He felt it is more important to watch observable, measurable events. Let's watch something and write something down. It makes it more scientific. He defines psychology as the scientific study of observable behavior. That's a, a little bit different definition than we're using, but that's Watson's definition of, of uh, psychology. Next guy, B.F. Skinner. Uh, there's Skinner right there. Very important, very famous. Um, he was known for his work in the field of reinforcement. Um, he was actually put his own daughter in a cage and uh, she had to perform certain things in order to get food uh, or in order to get other things. Uh, very cruel. She actually sued him actually after she turned 18. Um, very sad actually. Um, he showed that when animals are reinforced or rewarded for performing an action they are likely to repeat it. Your little dog sits up when you say sit and you give him a treat, he was likely to do it again. Um, the next group are the Gestalt psychologists. These are, um, don't worry too much about the names of these guys, but they are German psychologists. They are more concerned with how people receive information, influences how they interpret it. If um, you're in a bad mood and somebody comes and says, we're having um, an assembly today, you might go, oh gosh, another assembly. If you're in a great mood, everything's good and happy and somebody says hey we're having an assembly today you might totally take it different so it influences how you interpret what you receive uh, that term in the middle there if you're going down uh, that is a 13 12 13 14 if you're going across that's a B A B C just depends what you're around in order to interpret the information they focus on the big picture rather than the parts of the picture they focus on the forest not the trees uh, now, these older guys have, old schools, I guess you could say, have been more modified to form more important, and uh, I'm sorry, more modern perspectives. Um, the biological perspective emphasizes the influence of biology and behavior. Uh, they look at how different parts of your brain control behavior. We'll spend a whole unit on the brain and different areas of the brain and what it does for you. The evolutionary perspective, uh, they focus on... Um, what things are passed down from parent to offspring. You know, if your great-great-grandpa had a fear of a particular object, are you, do you have that fear? Uh, if they had a particular behavior, do you have that behavior? So that's what they look at. The cognitive perspective, whenever you see the word cognitive, it deals with your mind, so it emphasizes the role played by thoughts in determining behavior. How is what you're thinking determining what you do? They study how the mind develops over time and how it processes information. <clears throat> How do we process information differently than an elementary school, school student? Uh, you definitely, if I did this lecture to an elementary kid, he wouldn't learn anything. He needs something hands-on. Uh, the humanistic perspective, a little bit different, stresses the human capacity for self-fulfillment. just means that the only reason we do things is because we're going to get something out of it. The only reason I'm nice uh, to a particular person is because I think he might do something for me later. Uh, they believe that you're in charge of your own behavior. You're driving the bus. It's not the subconscious thing, but you 
and your needs are what drive what you do. Uh, the psychoanalytic perspective, this is kind of the Freudian path here. Uh, they stress the influence of the unconscious forces on human behavior. Uh, like we talked about with Freud, you, Linda, you, you, um, you live out your pent-up frustrations in other ways. Uh, you know, you hate your job, your boss yells at you all the time, so you go home and you beat your wife and kids. You know, you don't know why you're doing it, but that's why, because you can't do it there. The learning perspective, a little bit different emphasizes the effect of experience on behavior. Uh, you know, if you go into somebody, let's say you are go in your first night at cooking at a restaurant, and the guy who is training you has been doing it forever. He has done it over and over again, and he makes it look so easy. You're sitting there going, oh my gosh, I can't keep any of this stuff straight. So experience definitely changes the way you approach things. They feel the way you do things because of past learned experiences. You know, I know when they call you down to an assembly, it's probably going to be an assembly about don't do drugs or look how good these people are. That's pretty much what I've learned. That's your experience. You've seen it before. You'll probably see it again. All right. Uh, they have something called the social learning theory. It suggests that you can learn almost anything from watching others experience it. Now, I've been watching Michael Jordan jump and dump a basketball from the free throw line. doesn't mean I can do it, but you'd look at a math class. How do you learn your math problems? By watching other people do it. That math teacher works a hundred problems on the board, you learn from watching them. All right? And the last of them is sociocultural perspective. Uh, it addresses issues such as ethnicity, gender, culture, socioeconomic status, and behavior. You know, do poor people all act the same? Do certain ethnic groups? Why do some do better on tests than other groups? Do women uh, do better? Um, on do, uh, certain things and other. If I'm going to ask for a recipe on how to bake a cake, you know, it's a stereotype, but am I going to ask one of the guys in class or one of the girls in class? Uh, they look at things like that. Are some groups smarter than others? You know, the big question, are women smarter than men? Um, I don't think there's any proof either way. I mean, you know, some of the smartest, some of the best chefs in the world are men, but somehow that stereotype says that women can cook better than men. Um, you know, on math tests, men tend to do a little bit better. English tests, women tend to do a little bit better. So it's all totally up to the culture. So it's socio-culture perspective. So that is the end of our three lectures. Uh, hopefully you got something out of it. You can go back and look at these anytime you want. Um, I encourage you to take a few notes, uh, like I said, and the best idea would be to use those notes to go and do the review, which is on the lessons page. Thank you very much.